it's clear that a language model is a part of a solution, uh, but you know, how do you build an entire digital entity uh, that has all of the cognitive tools that humans have? So obviously we all think we need some kind of a potential system to, to actually like plan ahead and think through and reflect on what we're doing. And there's a lot more that you can take inspiration from. So for example, the hippocampus is important. What is the equivalent of the hippocampus for AI agents? Well, well it's uh, somehow like recording uh, memory traces and maybe indexing them using embeddings and retrieving from them, uh, something like that. So maybe that's kind of like the retrieval kind of thing uh, in the brain. Here's Andre Kompraffi, one of the great minds behind GPT-4. Here he's talking about how AI or AGI or AI agents will be very similar to how the human brain is built, the structure of the human brain. He's asking people to think about neuroscience and the different parts that come together to make human intelligence work. He asks us to think about it as an operating system. What things are responsible for memory? Where is the quote unquote seat of consciousness? Which things are like the RAM? Which things are like the hard drive? Here he's talking about the hippocampus, what's recording the memory traces. The reason this is important because recently we've seen the release of MemGPT towards LLMs as operating systems. Here's Andre Karpathy again. He's saying that a more complete picture is emerging of LLMs not as just a chatbot, but the kernel process of a new operating system. He says, I also like the nearest neighbor analogy of operating system because the industry is starting to shape up similarly. The operating systems such as Windows, Apple, Linux, etc., are those the same as GPT, Palm, Claude, etc.? An OS comes with default apps, but also has an app store. And he's saying, TLDR, too long didn't read. Look at LLMs as chatbots is the same as looking at early computers as calculators. We're seeing an emergence of a whole new computing paradigm, and it is very early. With that said, let's dive into MemGPT. This will be a series of videos where we discover how to use this thing one step at a time. First, in this video, we're going to talk about the paper. Next is going to be installing MemGPT. Then we'll talk about using MemGPT. We'll also see how it plays with Autogen. No, Autogen is a real word, I swear. It's real, I swear. And next, we're going to talk about how to use it with local models. Open source for free. So this will be a YouTube playlist, so each video will play one after the other. But let's take a look at this paper. So large language models, LLMs, have revolutionized AI bar constraint by limited context windows. As we've seen in the State of AI report, there are many, many people trying to increase the context window because it can be limiting for things like working with documents or extend conversations. The LMs tend to forget what the heck they're talking about. And so this paper by UC Berkeley, and I think some of these founders make a lot of appearance on YouTube videos, so you'll probably see some of these people around. They're saying to get beyond the context window limitations, they're proposing a virtual context management, which is something that was inspired by memory systems and traditional operating systems. This might be a helpful diagram. So this is your RAM, your sort of memory in the computer, and then you also have the hard disk. And as you can see here, as you move down the slope, the storage capacity is increasing. So you can store more and more and more and more, but also the access time, how long it takes to load is increasing more and more and more and more. Now, maybe ignore this for a second because I don't think this is necessarily has anything to do with what we're talking about. But the point is right now, when we're chatting with ChatGPT, you can think of that as RAM. Everything is stored in the in the main memory, in the RAM. But if you have too many questions, if you have too many details, then this happens. That's supposed to be a skull and crossbones. Could you tell? But basically this happens. They call it catastrophic memory failure. It basically starts forgetting what it's talking about. It's forgetting certain details. Some, some things it doesn't even store. You tell it your birthday and a couple days later, it has no recollection of it. Now there are workouts such as having it save some text to maybe a notepad or something like that. I've shown some applications like that on this channel that you can build with custom instructions, for example, and code interpreter. But really the solution to context windows might be really developing something akin to a hard disk. So in traditional operating systems, they provide the appearance of large memory resources through data movement between fast and slow memory. This is the fast memory and this is the slow memory. Using this technique, we introduce MemGPT, Memory GPT, a system that intelligently manages different memory tiers in order to effectively provide extended context within the LLM's limited context window. So they evaluate how well this works in, in basically two domains where just using ChatGPT is very limited, where the modern LLMs are severely handicapped. That's with document analysis and multi-session chat. So basically a back and forth chat that you keep going back to over and over again. And they release the code and data over here, which we'll look at in a second. Currently, the LLMs can only support a few dozen back and forth messages, 
or reason about a short document before exceeding their maximum input length. So this is interesting, extending the context length of transformers. So trying to increase how much of this sort of RAM, this fast access memory an LM has, makes the cost in computational terms, it increases quadratically. So it doesn't go up just a little bit. It goes up a lot. And the reason for that is the transformers architecture self-attention mechanism. We've also seen that in the AI report. Let's say I gave you 30 words to remember. Now you might remember the first few really well, and then your ability to memorize those is going to drop off. Interestingly, also towards the end, you might remember like the last few a little bit better. This would look like your sort of ability to memorize it curve. Interestingly enough, the same is true with transformers. If you give them long documents or a sequence of numbers or whatever to memorize, they tend to remember better towards the beginning of the list as well as towards the end. And they mentioned that here as well, that long context models struggle to utilize additional context effectively. In other words, just increasing the context window will have apparent diminishing returns and we need alternative techniques. And so in this paper, they propose creating the illusion of infinite context. And the approach borrows from the idea of a virtual memory and they design MemGPT, a system inspired by operating systems for virtual context management. So here we see the various things that can go into it. We have messages from the user. So basically a lot of things that a computer might have. So then we have the parser that kind of organizes this information, mainly splitting it into like the main context. This is probably what's going to be fed in to the LLM. So this is GPT or whatever. And then we also kind of have this looks like storage for external context. So these are the things that are ready to go into here on standby as needed, but we're only feeding it what's needed at the time. This is kind of saved for later. And then again, we kind of organize what needs to happen. We see if we need to send messages or read from memory or write to memory. So pause interrupts, we'll take a look at that later in the paper. We also get the yield, what sort of the, the LLMs are telling us. And we take that all and we feed back into the original parser as needed. So that again, it can go into splitting into the main context that gets fed into the LLM versus the external context, et cetera. So the main context is analogous to the OS main memory slash RAM. And then the output text is interpreted by a parser, this one, resulting either in a yield or a function call. So either it does something sort of internally within MemGPT to read memory or write or whatever, or yield meaning the answer from the LLM, the GPT or whatever it is. And so MemGPT uses functions to move data between main context and external context. So again, these are the functions. So let's say you say, hi, I'm Bob. Right. If you tell that to GPT, it'll remember for a little bit, but it'll forget very quickly. Certainly by the next session, it will no longer remember your name, just like the stranger you met at a bar. But instead of doing that, MemGPT writes your name down in its memory so that later when knowing your name is needed, it reads from its memory and gives it back to the LLM. All right. Next, we take a look at the different models that are available to us and the maximum tokens that it's able to hold at one time. So keep in mind, so with regards to MemGPT, the main context, which is analogous to RAM, basically to sort of that quick access memory and the external context, which is similar to, you know, the disk storage. So here are GPT-4 with 8,000 tokens and GPT-4, which has a 32,000 token window and that's limited API. So you do need some sort of a approval to get access to it. So if you think of the average message as about 250 characters, you know, the standard GPT-4, it's kind of right around 140 total messages. So for people that are not too familiar with tokens, you can just Google OpenAI tokenizer and this thing appears. So let's say we take a learn about language model tokenization and we plop that in there. It breaks it down into how many tokens it is. Now, what you'll notice is that most words in the English language will be one token. Learn is one token, about is one token, language is one token, model is one token. And token will also be one token. However, some longer words sometimes will be several tokens. Tokenization, for example, they break it down into token and ization. Misspellings will also be multiple tokens. Most symbols will also be one token. So in the English text, you can think of 100 tokens as about 75 words. And then of course we have Claude 2, which has 100,000 tokens. So it's also important to understand that when we're talking about the maximum context window, the context length, we're talking about everything, including the input, what you're asking the model to do, the output, what it's answering, but also there's a system message or pre-prompt that exists that we don't always get to see. So for example, in GPT-4, 
in ChatGPT rather, it tells the model, you are a helpful assistant among some other things. But that's the system message that it's given that basically exists in the background invisible to you with every single question that you ask it. And so they're saying because of the importance of the pre-prompt, it's common for the pre-prompt to consume more than a thousand tokens. So you can basically think of all of this as minus 1000 tokens, even before you start asking it questions. It looks like MemGPT, their pre-prompt is about a thousand tokens. So currently what I think is most likely that GPT uses is recursive summarization. Basically the way ChatGPT works, the way it's able to talk back and forth to you is it kind of summarizes what you've been talking about. But the more and more you do that, the more and more breaks down. Now I got to give Matthew Berman some credit on this because as I was reading this paper, the first thing that popped into my head is Marcus Brownlee uploading the same video to YouTube a thousand times. He created this stunning, I believe it was probably 4K video. He uploaded to YouTube, which compresses it. So this is the original file. He uploads it once. The YouTube compresses it to save on, on space. So as you can see, some of the quality is lost. And then he does it again and again. You can see that it's really becoming almost corrupted now. It doesn't even look like a real video anymore. And the same thing is happening with the audio as well. The audio is getting more and more distorted. So here you can barely make out any details. It is getting worse and worse and worse. And you can see the progression here as it just completely gets distorted, corrupted. And here's 300, 400, 500. It's getting some weird artifacts in there, the bluish, purplish tint. So here's one, 125, 250, 375, 500. You can no longer make out any of the facial features. Here's 875 and 1000. So that's the problem with recursive summarization. It's a simple way to address overflowing context windows, but it's inherently lossy. It loses information and eventually leads to large holes in the memory. So here's a, an example of how it works. So MemGPT says, hello, Chad, welcome. I'm excited to embark on this journey with you. As a PhD student in computer science, I can only imagine the fascinating ideas you're juggling. Can you share what you're currently working on? I'm all ears. I took the day off today. My mom baked me a birthday cake. So notice they're saying it's his birthday. Brenda is the mom. And it was his fairy cake, chocolate lava. So working context append. So append means add. Uh, so they're adding to kind of the storage space. His birthday, 11th of October. Favorite cake, chocolate lava. Made by mom, Brenda. And so the response, happy birthday. Nothing like a special treat to make the day sweeter. Blah, blah, blah. Mom, Brenda, chocolate cake. Sounds divine. And the rest is just sort of standard, blah, blah, blah. But the point is it figured out the important parts in this message and it saved them to its working context, as it's called. So the big part of this mem GPT is the self-directed editing and retrieval. It works as the thing that organizes where different memories go, what needs to get retrieved, etc. So here's an example of how that works. So mem GPT asks, it doesn't really matter what it asks, but the point is the user answers a question about its interests. Here are the interests. Now the system warns MemGPT, the conversation history will soon reach, reach its maximal length and be trimmed. Make sure to save any important information to your memory before it's removed. So MemGPT appends adds to the working context, key personality trait, enjoys high speed adrenaline rush activities like Formula One racing and intense gaming sessions in CSGO. CSGO just refuses to die. Holy moly, it's just getting more and more popular. That's mind blowing. So yeah, he likes CSGO. And so during each inference cycle, so during each answer output, the LM processor takes main context. So it looks like it's just saved into one string. So it's one variable where the whole thing is written out. And so it takes that main context as input and generates an output string. This output string, for those not familiar, so you can think of it as just a long sentence, right? So it's just all the thing in its memory is like a multiple paragraphs or whatever, that's a, a string. And so MemGPT part, it reads it to ensure correctness. And if everything looks good, the function is executed. And so that plus any errors that are logged, it's fed back into the processor by MemGPT. And so this feedback loop enables the system to learn from its actions and adjust its behavior accordingly. So it looks like the awareness of the context limits here during the summarization process is a key aspect in making the self-editing mechanism work effectively. And here's an example of what happens when you need to change something that it already saved. So MemGPT says, hey, you want to chat about horror movies? That's your favorite. And the user's like, oh no, I don't like horror movies. I like romantic comedies. So notice here MemGPT replaces, it uses this function to replace 
I watch horror movies with. I like romantic comedies. So it says, whoops, let's talk about romantic comedies. And so they're talking about MemGPT for conversational agents. So they're talking about how it's going to have consistency and engagement. So this is interesting. If you've been following what a lot of companies are doing now, they're trying to build these agents that are highly, highly engaging. So here's Sam Altman. He said something interesting uh, just recently. Here's what he said. Blink-182 still crushes it after all these years. Wait, that's not it. Here it is. I expect AI to be capable of superhuman persuasion well before it is superhuman at general intelligence, which may lead to some very strange outcomes. And that's why this little word engagement is so interesting. A little bit scary, but interesting because as we have these sort of personalized avatars that talk to us and as they learn more things about who we are, what we like, our interests, that engagement, that stickiness will increase. From there, it can get you to spend more time on whatever platform it wants you to stay on, perhaps guide your buying decisions, etc. And some memory management system like MemGPT will play a big, big role in this. So here are some tests that are run. So we're testing the different models, some with a recursive summary and some with MemGPT. MemGPT utilizes memory to increase engagement. So they notice that storing information in the working context is key to generating engaging openers. Without working context, the opener is significantly degrading in quality. So here's an example of that. The user says, I'm studying for the LSATs. I love coffee, I love tea. So the human baseline is what date is your LSAT test scheduled? MemGPT, working context and recall storage mentions the tea, the coffee, the LSAT study. Working context only mentions coffee and LSAT. So, I mean, these are both checks. And here for recall storage only, it's X because it doesn't mention any of the things that we, that the user talked about. And this is the interesting one. So MemGPT for document analysis. So to give you an example that, you know, Stephen King's best-selling novel, The Shining, contains around 150,000 words, which is about 200,000 tokens. Legal or financial documents, such as the 10Ks, can easily pass the million token mark. That's not even considering multiple lengthy documents that you might need to go back and forth across. And so to enable reasoning across documents, more flexible memory architectures like MemGPT are needed. So as you can see here, so the purple line is GPT 3.5, GPT 4 is the green line. And so we're looking at the accuracy as we retrieve more and more documents. So GPT 3.5 starts dropping. The dotted red line here is the effective context length. So as you can see here, both of them basically drop off once we get past the context length, but not MemGPT. MemGPT stays accurate. And here's kind of a similar thing when we're looking at nesting levels. MemGPT stays at a baseline while the other ones drop off. In both tasks, MemGPT's performance is unaffected by increased context length. And one last note that I want to make is this LLMs as agents. So interestingly here is they're talking about this one. This is the generative agents paper that we covered on this channel. This is where a number of these GPT-4 powered AI agents go about their daily life. They move around, take pictures, they run stores, they paint, they interact with each other in this little town called Smallville. There they have a generative agent memory, a memory stream that they use to save and recall various things that happen. So here they say that recent work has explored augmenting LLMs with additional capabilities to act as agents in interactive environments. So if we're using that LLM as a memory stream, a planner, another study shows the ability to train models to search the web before answering questions and use something similar to MemGPT to control the underlying context sized in their web browsing environment. And also how chain of thought reasoning can improve the planning ability of interactive LLM based agents. LLMs are able to plan out loud when executing functions. So that's it for this video. In the very next video coming up in this playlist, we're going to look at how to install MemGPT. And following that, we'll look at how to use it, how to use it with Autogen, how to use it with your local open source model so you can do it for free and much, much more. I'll include the playlist in the video description below. My name is Wes Roth. Thank you for watching.